quiet, so I guess that means it's about time to start. <laughs> so hi everybody, thank you for joining us for the Design the Future lecture series. Um, today I am proud and delighted to invite, uh, to introduce you to Brian Boyer. Um, in 1999, an 18-year-old Brian Boyer came to a party at my house in San Francisco. This is um, something like four or five lifetimes ago for both of us, back when he was in tech and I was in tech. And in the meantime, we ended up crossing over into some interesting ways. He studied interior architecture at RISD and did, then did a master's in architecture at Harvard. And I found myself interested in architecture as a way to frame things, and so I ended up studying architectural history. But we've always had a deep love, I think, for design and for especially strategic design, um, which you may hear more about tonight. Um, Brian Boyer is partner at Dash Marshall, where he leads the design and innovation practice focused on American cities. And this mean, means he's done things like developing the Global Atlas of Autonomous Vehicles with Vincent Adams, which is consultancy. Um, he was also a member of Citra, the Finnish innovation-funded Helsinki from 2009 to 2013. And what I think is so vital and interesting for this community here is how many different levels of design Brian's work touches on. And so that's why we have him here today. So please welcome Brian Boyer. Um, what? Well, th thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I, I don't teach currently. Uh, I, I just work in my studio all day, every day. So it's really nice to be in a room of people who uh, have more time to think deeply than I do, frankly, and, and to ask hard questions. And that's what we've been doing today in, in Molly's class and with some PhD students afterwards. So um, I, I hope that we continue that here. And, um, and being specifically at, at CMU is, is, of course, really uh, interesting for me as well because there are people like Terry, whose work I've followed for a while, and people like Stuart and Molly uh, and Dan Lockton and, and others here that are doing interesting things. So um, it's kind of, it's very fulfilling for me to be able to share some of my work in, in this context. So hopefully there's some resonance. Um, what do you think is going to get filled into that search box? Any ideas? Text. What text? <laughs> okay, you guys are all about to figure out or learn about my secret pastime, uh, which is searching YouTube for Parliament Fight. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this, is, this is actually from today. I, I discovered that time has done the hard work for me, and they put together this video that goes through Ukraine and Taiwan and South Korea and lots of other places um, where the parliament has devolved into a brawl. <laughs> and the reason this is my hobby is because in theory, in theory, the parliament, the congress, our spaces of government are places that were designed for the most careful, the most considered decision making. <laughs> and we know that that's not true, right? We know that things don't work the way that we'd like them to. <laughs> yeah. This one, I like this one. This person, like, they were very forward thinking. They brought an umbrella. Okay, um, and of course, like, that was showing a few countries. This country, and frankly, many countries, probably most, have at some point had that kind of battle. Maybe video cameras didn't exist yet. Um, we, I, I think we know that those, those government systems, including the spaces of government, aren't doing what we thought they might do when they were designed and when they were first created. Uh, so we, we know that there's actually no better example than um, the political climate right now, that things don't quite work the way that we might wish that they would. Uh, and actually, I wanted to, to kind of hop in a time machine with you all and, and go back to September 5th, 1774, because I think part of the answer to how we escape the chaos that we're experiencing now starts in 1774. So on that day, the Continental Congress gathered in Philadelphia at the City Tavern, and they walked a short way to Carpenter's Hall across the street. 
And there in Carpenter's Hall, the Continental Congress took a view of the room. And if you look at John Adams' diary from the day, he was one of the members of the Congress. There he is looking dour. Uh, what he says is, they took a view of the room and that the general cry was that this was a good room. And after that observation, then they actually started their work as the Continental Congress. So in my understanding of this very small blip of American history, the absolute first decision that the body that went on to become Congress made was a design decision. Before anything else, they observed the world, they said, is it fit for purpose? And they agreed yes, and then they went on to the work of politics. So this was something that actually I stumbled upon, literally stumbled upon in the library during my graduate thesis research. And it, the thesis was then a, a look at the intersection of the building of the US Capitol and the Congress itself as an institution. And I haven't been able to shake that. That's like the work that I've been doing since then is, is at that intersection of the institutions we create as humans and the kind of tools, including buildings and technology, uh, that either help us or hinder us in the pursuit of those institutions. So as Molly mentioned, I had started my career in technology and eventually decided I wanted to do things differently. And so I went back to school for architecture. And uh, I started school on September 11th, 2001. And I ended school during the global financial crisis. So I have no idea what normal architecture is. <laughs> and my business partners will tell you I'm kind of a bad architect. Uh, but um, I, I, because of that, partially because of that, had the opportunity to work in government when I graduated. And so I moved to Finland in 2009 and was uh, one of the founding members of something called Helsinki Design Lab, which was a design team, one of the first design teams in national government that was part of CITRA. Citra is a mythical creature that only exists in the Nordic portion of the world. Um, it's, a, it's a $1 billion endowment that is charged with looking after the long-term quantitative and qualitative well-being of the country that reports to parliament. So it has financial independence, it has political access, and it has a long-term mandate, which is something that you know, even our most forward-thinking foundations here are missing one part of that. Uh, triad. But the experiment that we ran was to basically say, great, the, the fund has been working since 1967. It's quite good at thinking through kind of traditional development from the perspective of, let's say, economic development or economic improvement in the country. But when we start to care about a more diverse set of outcomes, when we care not just about financial improvement, but also social and environmental outcomes, how do we work? And how do we make decisions? And our perspective was that that's a design challenge. That designers work in a context of blended values. That they make singular decisions with blended values. And so we, uh, I, uh, as part of the team and, and the few of us who were there, did this experiment of saying designers usually work in design studios where everybody else is like also funky designers with the right glasses and the right t-shirt and the right sneakers and the whole thing. And we wanted to see what would happen if designers were actually in the minority, that designers were working with financiers, lawyers, political scientists, economists, others. Uh, what's the value add that we could bring to that? And so I'll share just a, a couple of the projects to give you a, a sense of it. But really what we were doing is working with partners in national ministries and in uh, mostly Helsinki City Hall, but some few other cities around Finland, to frame their problems better or more in a more actionable way, and to think more broadly about what tools you could bring to bear to answer those problems or respond to those problems. So this is a part of Helsinki. This kind of zone here is called Jatkasari, uh, which was a, a shipping container port until I don't know, 2000 or so. That's why it's mostly empty there because the port has been removed when this video was taken. And the city was in the process of developing that as a new neighborhood. It's about a square kilometer, which is quite a luxury for most cities to suddenly find themselves with a square kilometer of land immediately adjacent to downtown. And the question, of course, is will Finland build this neighborhood to look like neighborhoods of the past or neighborhoods of the future? 
And one of the key questions for the fund at that point was the carbonization of the economy. So if we assume that we're going to build business as usual, that means at that time in Finland, we'll have little or no concern for the carbon footprint of the built environment. Because the main developers in the country felt that green real estate was not something that mattered in Finland and it wouldn't happen in Finland. Despite the fact that it was happening in Sweden and Germany and the UK and other near neighbors or, or peers. So the fund uh, had an opportunity to develop a block, a block of five buildings, so a city block. And we took that as a challenge. So let's build ourselves a new headquarters, sure. And by virtue of moving the headquarters to this neighborhood will connote some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of status on this development that we believe in it and we're an important actor in the city, so that's, that's useful. But what else can we do with it? So one of the things, of course, that comes up when you're designing a building is What's it made out of? Is it concrete, steel, or could it be, like this building, wood? Uh, and in Finland, it was actually illegal at the time to build a tall building out of wood, anything over uh, four stories or so. Uh, don't quote me. Um, so the building that we were working on, for all sorts of reasons, because Finland has massive forests, uh, that currently are used for paper, but could be used for other sources. Because Finland has the expertise uh, to build wooden buildings, and actually lots of experience building wooden buildings, like this, which at the time was the largest wooden structure in Europe, but happens to be in Spain, because it would be illegal in Finland. Like I said, has the industry. So you have kind of all of the things that you need to do something quite forward thinking in terms of just the simple question of how do we build this building, this new office headquarters. Uh, but of course, Finland at that time also had the memory of fires that had ravaged what was the capital, Turku, on the western coast. And those memories were enshrined in a legacy of laws and fire codes and other regulations that prevented structures from being made out of wood. So the question for us as strategic designers, not as architects, was how do you use this building as an excuse to do a lot more? And the way that we think of it is a Trojan horse. So a traditional developer might say, I want my building to be made out of wood. I'm going to negotiate with the city, do whatever I can to get this thing made out of wood. Uh, but of course, that doesn't change the status quo. All that does is allow you to do something that your competitors can't do. So our position as part of the government was to say, how do we change the status quo? How do we change the weather? How do we change this normal to create an alternate normal? And in fact, that part of the project was one of the most successful aspects. So the building which you see uh, located on the map there with the blue dot, um, we were able with very little money, somewhere around 30,000 euros of legal services, to work very closely with the Ministry of the Environment and help them rewrite the laws so that it was now legal to have large-scale timber construction across the country. So that's, of course, a win for our building. But the important difference is that it's a win for everyone else as well. So the low to no structure that I showed you could be built in wood, but so could any number of other future structures. And to maybe... Um, Make the story, if you're me, depressing, if you're other people, uh, maybe interesting, is that this, this project, our project, ended up being built in concrete. Because there is, if you remember the Euro crisis around 2012, 2013, and the government in Finland got really self-conscious about spending money. And so, in fact, the project that, that was the Trojan horse to unlock this new law ended up not being utilized, right? The, but everybody else was able to do it. Uh, and so there have now been, there have been five other projects in Finland that I know of that have been built with large-scale timber construction. Uh, and that's in the, let's see, that's in six or so years since, since the project, um, or eight or so years since the project started. So this is an example of where the work that we're doing is, is not about 
it's not about the building, it's about the systems around the building or those structures around the building, those, those things that actually enable everyday decisions to either go one way that looks more like the past or another way that looks more like, uh, from our perspective, a, a better future. Um, to stay on the carbon trend, Open Kitchen is, is quite a different project that we worked on, but uh, one of my favorites, um, it's about food. So the project came out of a, a, a mix of kind of different starting points. Um, one was that during the development of the previous project, Low to Know, we realized that it's not good enough to build a low carbon building if all the services there have a high carbon footprint. So if we're serious about it, we have to also start to develop low carbon services that can eventually occupy those spaces. Uh, and we found that in Finland, um, if, we, if we completely take care of the built environment and transportation, which are currently some of the larger sources of carbon, food for a country that far north is going to be one of the challenges. So food was something that was on the top of our minds. At the same time, if we look at the demographics uh, at that point of Helsinki, this was around 2012 when we were doing the project, um, Helsinki was going through a transition from having just under 10% to around 20% uh, immigrant population. And that's the threshold at which suddenly the fact that your city is diverse starts to be felt. And that's a challenge to a country that has really been very narrowly defined from a demographic perspective. Um, it's not, uh, not to say that they weren't welcoming it, but there's an adjustment that, that happens. And we wanted to figure out how we could get in front of that transition to make it as um, sociable as possible. We also did some empirical observations. So uh, the Finnish drinking culture is legendary. And who's been to Finland? Who's been to Helsinki? Who's been drinking out past midnight? Yeah, exactly. It's like the same number of people. Um, so this is, this is a map. The red line is showing opening hours of all the restaurants pulled from the the equivalent, like the Yelp equivalent of Finland. And the blue line is showing um, Let's, let's call it qualitative observations of drunkenness on the street, <laughs> right? So we sent, we sent Kale, a great photographer who took this photo out, and he spent the entire night like dodging vomit and other things on the street. Um, he took this photo. This guy's eating uh, the kind of classic Finnish street food at the time, which is basically chopped up hot dogs, onions, and uh, relish like with ketchup and and mayonnaise, it's like, it's, it's a, a mess. Um, so you can only enjoy that if you're drunk enough to leave that behind, right? Like that's um, kind of the, the qualitative uh, observation. But at the time, this was 100% of the street food in Finland. So the idea in America that we have nice like falafel vendors and like somebody making xiaolong bao and like all sorts of other stuff, no, it didn't exist. It was, it was pretty much just like industrially produced hot dog piles. <laughs> okay, and yet, similar to Low to Know, we know that the country has all sorts of resources. The forests are filled with mushrooms that are delicious and grow uh, naturally. There's a large reindeer population, which is a healthier meat than many others. Um, there are also unused spaces in the city. So from the 1910s, 20s, uh, Finland built a series of these things that are called kioski around the city. There are tiny little boxes that used to sell coffee and newspapers and stuff like that, and now mostly look like that. Um, that is not closed because it's winter, it's closed because of a systemic failure. So the question was, how do we turn them into this? How do we open up the kioski and how do we open up the streets and sidewalks for a much more diverse food economy? You might think that the previous one is because it was cold, but this is a cafe that is actually on the bay. It's on ice. Um, so in a place like Finland, and I don't know, maybe Pittsburgh, um, you know, the, the snow is not scary, right? It's like, you just gotta have the right boots. So um, we, we thought that we were going to have to create a food truck. And I was really excited by that, because uh, that's like, that sounds like a nice, exciting project. Um, I was gunning for falafel. But it, it, what happened while we were preparing that project, this happened. And this is something called Raventola Paiva, uh, which is Finnish for restaurant day. 
So just to narrate what you see here, there's obviously a big crowd of people on the street. This is a middle class residential neighborhood in Finland, no, nothing special. Um, the people here in the window, they have a, a basket that's on a rope. And this is, this is a woman dressed as an empanada. <laughs> and she's taking orders. And then they put the empanadas in the basket. And then people take the empanadas and, and they go on their merry way. So, so to explain what's going on, restaurant day is a festival where everyday citizens are encouraged to open a restaurant out of their own homes or on a street corner. And when this started, the deputy mayor, whose responsibility includes food safety and stuff like that, was very nervous. Uh, and, and, and yet, you suddenly have 100 people or whatever it was on the first restaurant day, probably you know, 60 or 70 people selling different food items, different corners of the city, and crowds like this all over. And so technically, those people uh, are breaking the law, right? But they're like breaking the law in the nicest way possible. <laughs> like it would be impossible to come and arrest these people, as, as my colleague Dan would say about this. So the way that, that we looked at this as the fund was you have underutilized assets in your city. You have people who clearly have cooking talent, otherwise there wouldn't be 50 individuals there. You have people who clearly have an interest and time to contribute to the food culture of the city, that contributing to that is part of also opening the cultural diversity of the city or reflecting the existing cultural diversity back to people who are already there. Um, and they found an outlet. They found Restaurant Day, which uh, on uh, the day itself, which was a couple times a year, suddenly the entire city was flush with different restaurants. And, and so this is a map of those restaurants. Um, but unfortunately, what happens is that what pops up on Restaurant Day pops down on the day after Restaurant Day. And so all of that investment is for naught. Right? It doesn't actually change the city in a lasting way. And so the question that we asked is, what can we do to bridge this gap between pop-up and business? So what we found when we went and spent time with the people who started Restaurant Day and some of the people who were participating in Restaurant Day is that some of them, actually the people who started the festival, they wanted to open a restaurant. That was their original idea. And they started the process of filling out all the paperwork. Uh, and this is the nice thing about Finland. Money is never the issue. It's not like... Like you, in America, the story would be, I wanted to start a restaurant, but I couldn't get financed, so I didn't. Uh, but in Finland, it's like, oh, it's just the paperwork was the hard part. So they found that that leap from pop-up to business was too much. So they said, forget it. We're not even going to bother opening the restaurant. We're going to have the festival instead, because that'll get us what we want, which is empanadas and falafels. So the question for us, from a systems view, from a strategic view, is like clearly there's something missing in the middle. And what is that thing that could allow pop-ups to transition more gracefully and with a higher efficacy rate into formal business? How do we lower the barrier of entry to formal business? And if we're doing that, who are the stakeholders that we can bring into that conversation? Right? So you could throw money at it, for instance. But all that is is leaving the system as is and giving people some extra means to navigate it. The way that we approached it was to bring in ourselves, Citra, this is Dan and, and I worked on this, the city of Helsinki uh, food strategy director, Vile Rolander, and then this is Anto and Elena. They ran a local restaurant group that was, they're like, Anto is one of the best chefs in Helsinki, uh, but also started a death metal band, because of <laughs> course. Um, and if you, yeah, if you get him drunk enough, you can get him to sing. Um, so I hear. I've never actually, I've never actually gotten them the same. So the, the project that we created, Open Kitchen, was a collaboration between the city, us as an extra-governmental organization, and local entrepreneurs. And what we did was use this thing that was basically a food entrepreneurship program. That's what it looked like. It was a boot camp for food entrepreneurs as a way to have a long-term discussion or a longer-term discussion with the city about how they might regulate public spaces, public real estate, food hygiene, and other issues related to food entrepreneurship. So we, of course, treated it. 
It's like the finished deadpan. So I'll, um, we don't need the audio. Anto's, uh, he's, he's basically making the call, inviting people to participate. The reason I show this video is to say that this was a government-funded project that was announced with a video, right? This was not like published in the newspaper the way that we would usually do things at Citra um, or, or gone through formal channels. Those things happened as well. But we know that the people that we want to bring into this are scrappy entrepreneurs who don't read that part of the newspaper. So we have to address them on their own terms. Uh, so the, the process yielded a dozen or so food entrepreneurs. They were specifically chosen so that half of them were of Finnish birth and half of them were new Finns, people who had come to the country, um, in some cases very young and in other cases more recently. Uh, and basically we, we ran them through a program that we developed which was uh, six weeks or so long that was half training and half testing. So we had courses in how to find real estate for a restaurant, which is particularly tricky in Finland, how to navigate food hygiene, how to think about a menu, how to think about service, how to think about ingredients and where you source them and whether they're sustainable or not, kind of all of the questions that you have as a restaurateur. But we did it in a way that represented the values of a future Finland, not the status quo. So for instance, it was not a green food entrepreneurship program because that only attracts people who think they care about making environmentally sustainable decisions, right? We want everyone to make more environmentally sustainable decisions. So for us, it was just a food entrepreneurship program. And that's just the way that we're going to do things. Uh, and we took a similar approach to the kind of convivial or, or social aspects of it. So uh, this is Anto standing in the restaurant. You see some profiles of a few of the people here. Um, after the program, Ani opened a cafe not far from Yatkasari, the neighborhood that I showed you. And this guy, Jerome. This guy's a Frenchman. Uh, he is now opening a bakery slash pizza restaurant, um, which I know because they're still part of my Facebook group. So uh, it's been interesting to watch them kind of develop because that's many years actually since the program. So they took over this place, uh, which is Kalahali. It's a, an old butcher hall um, kind of on, on the fringes of downtown. And, and they basically, they had that half of the program to soak in new knowledge, and then half of it to try running the restaurant together. And what we saw is that about a third of them decided they never, ever, ever want to run a restaurant. <laughs> Success. They're not going to waste their time later. The other half thought they were maybe on the fence, and a third of them were extra committed to it. And that includes some of the people that I showed you who went and actually did open a restaurant. So this is, again, another example of what a Trojan horse looks like for us. Uh, because this was, again, this was not so much about providing an educational experience for those people, although that must be high quality and it must be meaningful to them. What it was really about was helping the city of Helsinki think about its relationship to food and therefore the way that it, um, the way that it uh, puts that relation, it describes that relationship in regulations and laws and codes and everything else. And so one of the most interesting things that's come out of this and tracing the impact in a direct way is impossible. So I can make no direct claims. But the, the new strategy director for food in Helsinki is actually the person that started Restaurant Day. And so what we were trying to do in the beginning was to help them see Restaurant Day not as kind of deviance that you have to live with or accept, but as a vision of what your city could be, right? as a, a way of seeing the future uh, in front of yourself. And so in all of this work at Citra, um, we came again and again back to uh, Elil Saarinen, who's a, who's a Finnish architect, one of the more famous Finnish architects, the father of Eero Saarinen, who designed a bunch of modern furniture, um, who talks about always designing a thing by considering the next largest context. So a chair in a room, a room in a house, a house in a environment, natural environment and that environment in a city plan, right? And then the way that, that we would extend that at Helsinki Design Lab is by saying that all of that happens within the decision-making context. It happens within existing structures and systems that sometimes feel like immovable forces of nature, but are actually the incrustation of human decisions. That they have been designed by happenstance, effectively. 
and that it's our job as designers to carefully find opportunities to rethink those, those invisible rings around the things that we do as designers and to make that the site of our work. So kind of to separate this or be simplistic about it, traditional design, strategic design as a practice. Um, I'm going to pivot. If you're interested in more of this, one of the great things about working for the public sector is that you can publish everything for free. Uh, you don't have to worry about like trade secrets or any of that crap. So uh, HelsinkiDesignLab.org is the archive of our initiative. It was purposefully designed when we closed it as kind of like a, like a seed bank. So it has as much description as we can give about our work and lots of free books and other resources. Um, so I'd encourage you to check that out. The thing that I've been excited about since HDL, uh, and this came up in the research for Leap Dialogues, which is a book that I co-edited with Liz Danzico and uh, Mariana Amatulo and Andrew Shea. Uh, we were looking at how are designers practicing social impact design. Right? So if that's what you're interested in, and you happen to be a designer, what do you do? So we had around 80 people who were interviewed or part of discussions in this book. And the most encouraging thing we found is that designers which in the past have mostly worked inside agencies or studios or ateliers surrounded by other designers were increasingly making this jump, right? Working inside governments or, or big corporations. And kind of this, to me, is one of the things that I take great hope in, that there is a move. Uh, I wish there were more people, and we were talking about that this morning, or sorry, this afternoon, um, about um, how do you encourage more designers to have the courage to jump into, say, City Hall? Like, go work for the mayor. Um, how do we make that as attractive as being the designer at uh, IDEO, or being a designer at Ford, or Apple, or Facebook, or any of those alternatives? Um, and the reason why I think that's important is because that's where scale happens, right? So if you're inside an organization, you're closer to decisions that are made, and you're able to have an outsized impact on those decisions. Um, the, the focus that I have these days um, kind of combines the work at HDL with a few other angles. So this is a map of uh, trust in public institutions from the Pew Charitable Trust. Um, the details don't really matter except for it's down, right? And it's down in America, as I think we all know, and it's down in many other places. Um, at the same time, uh, this is a graph showing the transistors per microprocessor. Uh, it's a logarithmic scale, so that flat line, that like inclined plane is actually a bit inaccurate. It should be a hockey stick. Uh, there's excess computing power that's increasingly being put into the world. And there's also uh, growing urbanization uh, here in the US and in many places. So at Dash Marshall, the work that we've been doing in our civic futures practice is at the intersection of the decline of institutional trust and the growth of both computing power and urbanization. So we feel like if we want to talk seriously about the future of cities, you have to confront those three trends. And that any conversation about the future that is really, um, let's say, plausible is going to have a perspective on what, what technology is going to do, uh, how we're going to rebuild the physical character of our cities, and what institutions we need to govern both of those. So Cedric Price is a British architect who's very famous for saying, technology is the answer, but what was the question, right? Um, and I actually think that, yes, this is important, but the thing that we've been focusing on is how do we ask the question, right? How do we uh, negotiate or debate as a society what kind of future we want, what alternative we want? And the reason why this is important, and I think there's opportunities for designers now, is because the way that we've done that in the past is with a political system. And it's proven very difficult for our political system to satisfy us. And that's why we have elections that increasingly are at a 50-50 split, it seems. Like. So this question of how do you ask, or the, the, the idea of how do we ask these questions uh, is something that needs exploration. And actually, um, Justice John Paul Stevens, uh, to put two old white dudes back to back, sorry, um, 
is, is, has become really meaningful to me because I don't actually remember which decision this is from, but at some point he basically says, strategic decisions only happen when you have legitimate alternatives to choose from, right? And so I think broadly speaking, the challenge that we face right now, if we take randomly, scooters, e-scooters in your city, good or bad, is that that's not the right way to ask the question. Right? That's a crappy question to ask. The question is scooters or this or that or that. So we need to find a way to manifest legitimate alternatives. And that then we need to find a way to make decisions between those legitimate alternatives. Because the way that we currently make decisions about the city uh, is often more like, do you want this, yes or no? Okay, do you want that, yes or no? Well, okay, well, do you want that, yes or no? And that's just not the way that we do things everywhere else in our life. So I don't know why we should expect it to work in the city itself. Um, I, I have spent too much of my life studying architecture. So um, I look at the kind of utopian lineage uh, within architecture itself. This is by a, a Frenchman named Ledoux. Um, he was, of course, challenged. This is from the Industrial Revolution era. So he's challenged with what industry will do to cities and how you translate that into a utopian vision. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright also did the same thing. He added helicopters, uh, which you can see up in the top. Uh, but there's a, a long lineage of architects envisioning futures of society. Unfortunately, all of these are from the bird's eye view, right? And so what we've been trying to do in our work is to take, um, take that same ambition to think about the grandest scale, but to connect it with a human-centered perspective of what the experience is like for real people on real streets doing real things. Um, I'm going to show, I'm going to think about how much time we have and show an example. So, for instance, in Philadelphia, and for those of you who were at Molly's class, forgive me for repeating myself. In Philadelphia, we worked with the Knight Foundation to help them think about the way that you could re-envision public assets. So parks, pools, libraries, uh, street trees, trucks, uh, all sorts, websites, all the things that we own in, pub in common as a city, how do you reimagine those so that they contribute to better social outcomes across the city for everyone? So our thinking is that there's a lot of opportunity in using, for instance, technology to invite people into uh, new relationships with those spaces. So could we imagine making it easier for people to book events in a public space like a park? And if we do that using natural language and basic technology, does that give us a sense of where people are and when in that park? Um, of course, there are potentials for creepy Big Brother overtones, but there's also an opportunity for being simply helpful, right? That if you show up with 30 people in a park for a family reunion, you probably actually do want to know what to do with the recycling. And wouldn't it be nice if somebody could just magically show up and tell you what to do or even help you with that? And if you're going to deploy people, human resources in those spaces, how do we reuse things like the printers that are used for parking tickets to not just be implements of, of prosecution effectively, but also uh, starting points for joy or for usefulness? So is there a way to use uh, surplus machinery from the police department to say, actually, let me give you an idea of what else is happening in the park, what you might want to do after your family reunion? Can we connect you, for instance, to a farmer's market that's in another part of the city? And if we can do that, effectively, if we can start to imagine that technology can help us to make those connections, uh, what would that do for the utilization of the park system writ large? And if we can bring people back into public parks, uh, bring them back into libraries, bring them back into rec centers and out of their private opt-out options like private health clubs and private pools and things like that, is there a way for us to also then increase the constituency of people who vote for and uh, support investment in those spaces. If we're doing that, how do we re reflect these changes back to the city? So this is a, a bus stop billboard that's imagining that if we were more smart about technology and more smart about participation, we might be able to be very specific about saying thank you. 
So if this bus stop gets located in front of the library because that's what the community wants, it's not just thanks for having a voice. It's thank you to 416 residents, four open data streams, and five city workers who were part of this. So what we're trying to do in this project is to say that the city, the industrial city that we've inherited, the experience of the industrial city, is something that's predicated on the, the idea of abstraction, of like the collective us. Now that's alienating. And that instead, what we can do is use technology to manage the complexity of exactly 416 people, exactly four open data streams, and exactly five city workers, and then reflect that back to people to say, look, you actually had a difference. It was 416, not 415. That it doesn't have to all be about technology. It can be really basic, right? That it's also just about putting pieces of paper in the library saying, like, we got an empty room. What do you want to do with it? Uh, that you can... You can reserve it with an online system or, or with a piece of paper at the front desk. And then it's about being uh, kind of transparent about those systems in a playful way. So this is a mock-up that we did of a city kind of public works truck, right? So we have, of course, fire trucks and police cars and ambulances and all the things that three-year-olds get excited about when they see them on the street. But those are dwarfed in numbers by the anonymous vehicles of the city, by the flatbed trucks and other things. So why are they blank? Why don't we celebrate those? Why don't we give ourselves an opportunity to understand that actually the infrastructure of city making is all around us already? And so what we're showing here is a series of trucks with very simple phrases, the phrases on these vehicles have been used, uh, sorry, have been constructed using a list of critical words for early learners. So they're specifically designed for children to look at and point at and say, you know, kind of stutter out, we take care of what? Right? Because that creates moments of interaction between the children and their parents or the children and their caretakers. And it creates a moment of curiosity between those children and this system that they're engaging with in a new way. So in all of the work that we're doing, it's, it's kind of similar to what you're seeing here. It's sort of cutting across um, very kind of traditional prosaic forms of design, like the paint on the side of a van, with much higher level systems level intentions about what that could do. Why would you paint the side of a van? Let's not just paint it because we're supposed to paint it. Let's paint it with intention. Um, to change gears quite dramatically, uh, we spent last year working with uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Aspen Institute on the question of autonomous vehicles in cities. Uh, they had assembled a network of 10 global cities that, to give you a sense, range from London to Nashville uh, Sao Paulo to Tel Aviv, so like quite a mix, and asked us to support that group to uh, kind of develop the muscles of imagining a different future, a future where the mayor and, and the mayor's kind of close huddle of team uh, could say, could be articulate about what kind of future they want, and not just accept the future that comes from Ford or from Uber or Lyft or whoever. So our starting point was that this is important precisely because although motorization happened relatively quickly, automation will happen even faster. So that transition, there's time, but we need to get working on it quickly. It will be, autonomous vehicles will be much more diverse than we are currently talking about them. So the way the industry has led the dialogue is we will simply replace human drivers with computers, but the cars will look the same. Uh, we felt, as the project team, it was myself and, and Bits and Adams, that there will be a Cambrian explosion of essentially robots in cities. And if that's the case, we need to be um, much more exploratory about what those different impacts might be. We felt through our research that it's quite likely because of the cost of vehicles and the regulatory context that your first interaction with an autonomous vehicle is almost certainly not going to be riding in one. It will be something like this mail delivery robot from Germany, uh, or perhaps a street cleaner or something along those lines. And the, of course, mobility is never about mobility. So this is from the protests from uh, 2013, 14 or so of people uh, protesting against the Google buses in San Francisco, right? They weren't protesting them because they hate buses. 
They're protesting them because they don't want their housing prices to go up. And the same thing is true of the transition to autonomy, uh, to autonomous mobility, is that it's going to force us to rethink housing and work and all sorts of other issues. So what we were trying to do is, is kind of help people comprehend that because uh, they're really cute when you have one robot on the street. But then they get kind of scary when your streets are filled with robots, right? So we need to help policymakers see the future potential, both in good and bad, so that they are in a position to make better decisions. So how do you do that? Um, we started, one, we did three basic things. We made a primer, which is a, a book that you can put in your briefcase and read on an airplane flight. Easy. And that's like, what's the vocabulary that I need as mayor to understand autonomous vehicles and have like a base level of confidence about it? The second is uh, this. This is a, a website that's live currently, uh, which is a, a map of all of the autonomous vehicle pilots around the world where the municipal government is involved. So if Uber, Uber goes and does something on their own, they're not there. But if the city has helped make way for them, they're on the list. It's currently at 100 and something. This is showing 112, but it's a little bit more than that. Um, so for each one of those cities, there's a, basically a kind of lightweight policy briefing. Right? It's telling you, this is the city. This is what they're doing. Here's a few words about how it happened. There's a picture, because if you don't have a picture, nobody wants to look at your website. <laughs> and there are some basic tags, so that if you are interested in creating a pilot zone, you can find other people who are doing that. So this is about fixing a gap in the market of ideas right now that there are very few people who are doing it and they feel isolated. So how do you connect them? And that set us up to do this, which is a set of scenarios, six scenarios. Um, it's confusing because there are four pictures on the screen, but the purple one has multiple scenarios inside of it. Um, we, we created a set of scenarios that are basically um, stories. They're stories for mayors. They're stories because that's what mayors have time to read. But those stories have been intentionally designed. Uh, for instance, this one, which is about basically having a mile-by-mile -mile tax on market rate taxi services to fund taxis for people in food deserts or with mobility issues or other kinds of challenges so that autonomy is spread across the city and not just um, something that's available to people who can pay for it. Each of these stories is told through text narrative. Uh, we sent a journalist friend of ours out to interview technologists and, and people in public policy and others to tell the story. Data, because data is what's meaningful to people who are in City Hall, many of them, and strong visuals. So each one of these ideas is brought to life uh, with a story that we developed kind of very carefully from collages into sketches and more sketches into final imagery. Um, but we're trying to give people a sense of what a pro, like a pro, pro social, if you can call that, or a sociable idea of technology looks like. So this is uh, showing micro shuttles and how those, you might start to have, for instance, uh, large universities in medium sized cities uh, operating their own shuttle networks. And you might have shopping malls and uh, skyscrapers and other types of entities also running their own shuttle networks because it gets easier and cheaper with AVs. So how would a city start to encourage those shuttle networks to link up and form an interlocking ring of transportation? Not just isolated point-to-point -point transportation. Um, and I'll, you can read the website to figure out why. But what we're doing in all of this is telling the same story through four or five different media, including my favorite in this case, which is the PowerPoint download. Because what's the native language of government? Um, so the scenarios themselves, similar to kind of a lot of the work that we try to do at, at Dash Marshall, is at this sweet spot of somewhere between, like, if you let your technological mind run wild, or if you hold human needs constant, or think about social innovation, if we look at what policy levers we can pull as a city government versus what kind of market forces we're up against. And this is a real one for cities because many of the uh, levers that government have are actually not at city level. They're at a federal level or a state level. And so there's a real challenge there. Um, and similarly with the market, that the, you know, if, you're, if you're Pittsburgh, you have some muscle. If you're, what's a small town outside of Pittsburgh? I don't, know, I don't know where I am, so I don't know any of the towns. But if you, don't look at me. I've only lived here three and a half 
if you're like you somewheresville population 10,000, you're going to have a very hard time competing against market forces because you simply, it's a, it's a scalar question. So somehow um, our leaders have to find a way to navigate the, these forces that are around them. So the scenarios that we developed, they're about uh, taxis and shuttles and buses and ushers or street robots. Conveyors are delivery things like that one that almost ate the dog. And rovers are like bicycles and scooters and, and hoverboard and all that type of thing. They're, on their face, they look like they're about those devices because that's the easy way for people to grab onto it. Um, they're actually stories about policy priorities, ranging from expanding access to enhancing resiliency and sustainability or even dealing with public finance. And what they actually are at their heart are stories about individuals. So each one is told through, part of the story is told through a slideshow that's hooked on the life of this, excuse the expression, focus group from the future. Um, which is something that, that maybe we can come back to if we have time. But um, the, <clears throat> this is the set of URLs if any of that work is interesting. But the, the thing that I wanted to say here is, what we're trying to do is marry a human-centered process to a strategic or systems perspective, right? Because we need both of those to happen. Um, but unfortunately right now, I feel that the human-centered design process has kind of overwhelmed other considerations. Um, almost done. The, similar to this transition of designers into government, we also see designers moving into big companies, right? So like from one point of view, it's amazing that designers are moving, that companies like IBM are hiring tons of designers. It's actually, it's, it's really a transition. Um, but I also feel as though there's a moment of um, some kind of confusion right now for people like those in this room. So it's 2010s, we have a lot of different ways to talk about design. Um, we kind of, you know, it's like if you squint, they're all the same. But if, if you don't squint, we can have a knife fight, like <laughs> talking about the differences. And I've just been wondering, like, why? So uh, one of the great things of the, the early work in Helsinki was to go back to the archives. And in 1967, Citra funded a gathering of designers and all sorts of other people um, and they were talking about things like cybernetics, system engineering, design methods, environmental design, the birth of HCI, ergonomics, also the birth of that. Um, and I think that the fact that our current moment in design has this, um, you know, this, this plural, this pl plurality of different definitions of design practice, it actually echoes something from the 60s. Uh, so people like Buckminster, oh, sorry, that's Victor Popinek, um, and uh, others who were at this event in 1967 in Helsinki were having a conversation um, that actually, if, if you go back and read the letter that they used to ask for funding, it sounds exactly like today. It says, the rate of change is changing, resources are scarce, technology is part of the answer, but we don't know what part. Uh, we have to figure out how to collaborate, and we think cybernetics is part of it. <laughs> so the cybernetics one is the only thing that tells you it's not 2010. The rest of it is exactly as it is from today. Uh, and if you look at some of the materials, so this is a student publication from that era. Um, Bucky Fuller was one of the guests at the event. He also wrote something for this publication. Um, the highest level of ambition, right? So this is... Uh, J. Christopher Jones talking about the future of cities. He's got some metabolist stuff going on. That article down in the corner is basically saying, like, cars, WTF. Uh, obviously, we didn't learn the lesson. And if you read it, sounds like 2018, right? So this, it's tempting to think that this is maybe just a Western thing, but the 
Japanese, at least, were doing similar kind of work. This is the metabolist. Uh, this is Kishio Kurakawa, who is working on uh, kind of large-scale ideals for settlement, and then also kind of systematic approaches to, uh, or sorry, thinking through social systems, and actually doing that work for the Japanese government in the 60s. Uh, I'm sure there are other examples that I'm not aware of, but, but this is just to say that it was kind of a global concern. Um, they were working on things. This is also a project by uh, Kikutake, another Japanese architect. It's a house he built for himself. Uh, it's on a hillside, but he created this new ground, partially because that's what modernists did. It was just their thing. Um, but really because, as you can see here, they wanted to create a building that could adapt to different circumstances. So you have another kid, you add another room that kind of hangs from that new ground. Um, addressing some of the concerns that they had of expansion and ability to meet the needs of, of the society at the time. These same ideas are today in play. Uh, and they're in play with a very precisely uh, developed sense of human-centeredness. And it looks like this, which is a luxury cottage that will cost you some hundreds of thousands of dollars and will be delivered with a helicopter from some very photogenic Danish people. Um, so this is kind of the challenge, is that the human-centered perspective um, is really good at delivering things like OXO good grips or these other uh, implements that are individual, that don't require trade-offs or compromises. And they're incredibly useful for this. And they're starting to be used, as you all know, in other contexts, right? I mean, I, I myself use human centered design with governments. Um, and it's happening here in the US. Uh, this is some work that the public policy lab that, I was, that I'm on the board of has, has been working on as well. Um, they all have, so I call this the post-it note fiesta, and it's everywhere. So it, something's working. But my question is, is that the right tool to figure out the energy grid? When we're making decisions that are bigger than any human, that they are not about my personal satisfaction or my grip of the tool, they're actually about us. Do we have the right approaches? So somehow, on the one hand, we're very good now at creating products or technical innovations, but we're challenged still by things that are systemic or social in nature. And my belief is that any system is inherently social because it's, it's uh, transacted on, on our interactions. So Bucky, of course, talked about um, if you want to fix things, you've got to invent a new one that's even better, which is like, great if you're talking about a refrigerator but it doesn't work so well if you're talking about a school system. So the question now is, how do we make that transition? And I know that's something that you all here are, are focusing on, and, and that, frankly, helps me sleep better at night. Um, but it's something that, that we're kind of working on very slowly in our studio as well. Uh, and, and I wanted to just end with some thoughts about an opportunity for all of us, uh, which, is, which is in the space between these. So my observation is, in the 60s, uh, this era that we've been soaking in for a little bit now with these slides, um, you have a very motivated group of professional and academic uh, designers and others who are focused on the, the biggest challenges of the day uh, and understanding that we need to be very ambitious and very large scale in our work. Uh, and you have at the same time also a very active counterculture. This is actually... Um, Read that book. It's a great encapsulation of all of it. Um, so convenient that somebody else wrote it for me. <laughs> <laughs> so you have Bucky on this side and you have Ant Farm on this side, right? So from super highbrow to, uh, I don't want to say lowbrow, but like uh, just like super fringe weirdo. <laughs> um, and today we have rooms of people thinking about redesigning systems. And we have people who are writing reports for OECD, like my very good friend Justin did, looking at systems change. It's, it's there. It's happening. It's starting to move into those circles of power. It's, it's kind of systems change is, is given, has been given access to the, the mythical table. Uh, but what I'm missing is the subcultural equivalent. How do we manifest a culture of change that it doesn't require a master's degree to participate in? 
And you know, right now, when I look at what's happening, like there are people who are thinking about culture change, but they're thinking about it in a way that's orthogonal to how I'd like to see it happen. And I think somehow this is, you know, we, we, I've been trying to figure this out as a designer. Like this was a set of postcards we made for the for the city hall, basically in Helsinki. It was like trying to get them to think about circular economy and all sorts of other issues, which. Each of these postcards could have been a dissertation, but we're like, let's put it into 100 words, just as a test. Or from Philadelphia, that project that I showed briefly, if we want people to support and vote for stuff, why can't they buy a t-shirt about it? Like, How do you start to create a, a cohort of people around the things that are meaningful to us? We do it for bands. We do it for companies. Why don't we do it for street trees? Like, it's, I know it sounds stupid, but... Um, somehow we have to find a way to, to participate in very abstract, very refined conversations and very simple conversations about the same ends. Um, or the, this pin, which I have uh, a ver an early prototype of, um, was like the super test for us. How do we make like, like the secret icon for strategic designers to spot each other <laughs> um, without any words at all, right? So um, when I think about Brand, Stuart Brand, or Frank Duffy, who he kind of borrowed it from <laughs> or stole it from. Um, this, this diagram has been, this is the next pin that I'm working on. Because this diagram has been really at the root of my thinking, where uh, the, the things that create lasting change are kind of on the bottom of this, and the things that create less lasting change are at the top of this. And we're increasingly good at that top those top layers, uh, figuring out how to make things that are relevant to people and are really catchy, really viral. In fact, probably too catchy. Like that's why we now are having a conversation about social media addiction. Um, we've we're kind of starting to rebuild or like 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 re-exercise this muscle of systems thinking that happens in those slower registers. But of course, both of those are problematic for the reasons that, that we talked about. So the thing or the opportunity that, that I'm searching for now, and I, I hope you guys all have the answer to, is how do we do things that kind of connect the speed of fashion and commerce, but allow us to open up questions that are about culture and governance and those deeper layers? And the opportunity, I think, for design is to consciously create things that might look like they start here, like a building, for instance, in Helsinki that's built out of timber, and actually lead to changes down here that are enshrined in laws and regulations and allow the future to be manifestly different than the past. So that's my challenge to you, and I'm sure that you're going to figure it out. So thanks. <laughs> Yeah, well, I th so that's the interesting thing about uh, technology is that that's the interesting thing about digital technology is that mm -hmm. there's, or no, let's be even more specific, digital network technology is that their scale is inherent. So in that case, it's both because we can design an interface with all the dark patterns that we want, right, to be incredibly catchy and viral and addictive and all the other nice things, um, but there's, n there's no law that says that we have to also think deeply about the implications of what that addiction might mean. Um, and there's, you know, I would say to be charitable, there's like an emerging practice of thinking through that. Uh, so I think that's, that's one of the issues that we're grappling with now is that we've kind of realized, oh, oh, crap, like we can build these tools that do have an outsized impact. So, you know, when Mark Zuckerberg was at, um, was at the Senate panel that he was testifying in front of, and he was saying, I didn't design Facebook to be a globally, or, you know, a tool that had 2 billion users. I, I was making something in my dorm room. Like, I actually believed the guy. 
I mean, I, I think you have to give somebody a, a, like a charitable interpretation and say, yeah, when you started out, that's probably, you probably weren't thinking about that. Um, but, but that's the situation that we're in now. So I think the question then is, I mean, we could have a debate whether or not uh, we should regulate those kinds of tools and whether they should be forced to make certain considerations. And then we could talk about how you might do that. Do you model it or do you simply debate it in the same way that we might debate something like a highway system you know, or adding a new bridge or something like that? That's a separate topic. Um, but I, I think what, what I am trying to put forward here is that we, we increasingly have to own not just the things that we make, but the repercussions of the things that we make. And you know, I think that's something that's happening broadly uh, as culture moves from, as our culture moves from mostly caring about dollars to enshrining a care for dollars and social outcomes and environmental outcomes, like all together in a triple bottom line sense, to be simplistic about it. That as we do that, then there's an opportunity to develop a practice. So we have some thousand years of history in uh, accounting, financial accounting. So we're really good at it, right? Like we have great spreadsheets and we have great double entry accounting practices and we have great manipulation of all of those things, but we've had a long time to practice it. So as we move to a point where we're making decisions, and I say we, not just designers, but like politicians and CEOs and others are making decisions based on blended forms of value, what's the rigor that's there? How do you put that into Excel? Excel is useful because it allows scale and speed. So if we want a new form of values-based decision-making to happen, we need to figure out how to do it at scale and with speed. And I think that's part of the, the, that's part of the debate that needs to happen and that I hope will happen as, as we continue to kind of understand the implications of these digitally networked tools that we have, especially when they start to connect to the city. So you know, part of this conversation that we were having with the cities around um, autonomous vehicles is like, how are you going to make this work in a way that is actually fair and equitable and inviting to people? Like, are you going to require everybody to have a credit card? If you don't, are you going to have a cash machine on your AV? Does it make sense to have a cash machine, you know, like a, a, a bill receptacle on an eight-person AV? What about on a four-person AV? What about a one-person AV? Yeah, you know, it's just kind of like kind of walking through those questions in a, in a detailed way, which I think is something that designers have a... Um, a unique ability to do. Any other questions? Sure. Um, I love the presentation. Thank you for being here and for making it. Um, it seems to me that there's a, a kind of move that you're demonstrating through many of these cases, um, a kind of use of a, of a deceptively simple project, not that they're simple, but they're simple vis-a-vis -vis the bigger complexities that they're trying to address. And like using an app or a, a sort of education uh, program or a building, um, I mean, which have their complexities, but using those as tests or probes to see what the capacity of a larger system beyond those probes um, has to change. Yeah. And I have a lot of questions about, about that. Um, but it seems to me that that the one way of describing what that is, and maybe this is how you've been thinking about it and why you ended on the note that you did with the paste layers diagram, but it seems like you were using kind of the, the uh, upper layers to maybe address the lower ones in some sense. Yep. Um, and I wonder if that is kind of how you have been thinking about it, and if so, what that, you know, what sort of further design possibilities that way of thinking about it discloses. Yep. And then the other thing, is in the time that you've been doing this, um, to what extent you've seen people picking up on this move? Because it's, it's ingenious, but it's also really complex. Like, it's not easy stuff to do. And replicating it, not in the sense of doing exactly this, but making those highly context-sensitive moves at upper levels to affect lower mm -hmm. ones, is, do you, are you seeing that catching on? I mean, is this something that design students can learn to do and, and uh, you know, finish their degrees ready to roll out and, and, and do over and over again in the context they find themselves in? Uh, that is the subject of a book that I'm working on right now, <laughs> <laughs> which is um, 
I, what I see in design schools is an increasing interest in uh, owning the thing and the repercussions of the thing, right? The stone you throw in the pond and the ripples that come from it. Because I, I think because in a way it's common sense, right? The idea of just creating a thing and not caring about its impacts is kind of silly at this point. So of course, smart students get it. Um, and the question is then, where do you go to work afterwards? And I don't think that there are enough places for those students to work uh, if they are dead set on being a designer, as in their business card says designer. But there are infinite opportunities if you are interested in, let's say you're really passionate about education. Go work in the Department of Education. And you bring your ability to make those connections between the concrete and the systemic as your superpower to your anonymous job title in the Department of Education. Or same thing in City Hall, or same thing at an NGO, or same thing at uh, you know, a company that um, is not completely extractive. <laughs> so I, I think the, the, the question of like, actually Roger Martin, who was the dean of the business school at, at University of Toronto for a long time, put it really well. He said, because he's a, a huge advocate for design but he's a business professor. And somebody at a design conference that I was attending asked him, why are you a business professor? And he said, just look at the numbers. The amount of business students that graduate every single year in North America swamps the number of designers. So you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done to advocate and create room for designers, and that's part of what Public Policy Lab and others are doing. But it's, it's something that has a long way to go. So I think if you really care about it, there are other opportunities that kind of find the way around that. But you also asked about using something like a building uh, to think about changing laws or, or the, the deeper systems. And you know, I described that as a Trojan horse and slightly nefarious. Um, but what we've what we tried to do at Helsinki Design Lab and really like what I've been focusing on in, in my career is uh, I I care about I care about designers working in these contexts right that uh, politics is too important to be left to politicians the same way that some people say design is too important to be left to designers well we can we can use the same medicine uh, so if if that's the case then we simply have to make it easier. We have to make it easier to talk about, easier to understand, easier to transmit, easier to do. The easier to do is, that's very hard. <laughs> it's very hard work, um, as most things are, if you really put your mind to it. So I started on the easy end of that. Like We have to bring some vocabulary to this work that we're doing. And we, not just as designers, but we are also technologists, public servants, business people, et cetera, people who are not happy with the, an industrial society status quo and want to live in a different future. So we have to find ways to talk about uh, making that old system obsolete. And the way that we talked about it from a design perspective is this idea of a Trojan horse, that when you are designing a building, if you stretch, you can think about its impact or its ability to help people see that alternate future. And that's not always available. So like I said, with this project, if you were a private developer, a private developer doesn't have the time or money to care about changing the law. They only want the special dispensation for their building. So I'm kind of con consciously and constantly looking for those uh, places where there is just enough slack that you can think beyond the concrete. And I, I think actually, you know, going back to the earlier question, I think that's one of the big um, I think it's, this is a big statement, but I think it's one of the big failures of American society that we've allowed some of the largest concentrations of wealth in our country, which are venture-backed companies in Silicon Valley, to execute their products without much consideration for what goes beyond. And that we need to find a way to put that capital to work for good. So just one last thing. The, on the one hand, you're arguing for a kind of legibility and accessibility to these conversations and making them more participatory and more sort of sincere in their effort to, to serve everyone. And on the other hand, there's this 
model and fits there in the metaphor of the Trojan horse, which, like you said, is kind of nefarious and a little bit discreet or even subversive in what it's doing. Not, not transparent, but opaque. Yeah. Can you comment on that tension um, between you know, the desire to have overt public deliberation in service of better futures and the kind of savvy smuggling that, uh, that a Trojan horse is bringing to the table? Yeah. Um, trying to find the right image for it. I, I think, if I go back to this, I, I think it's, it's a transitional strategy, <laughs> Terry. <laughs> um, I, I think that it's going to be very abstract, so excuse me, but uh, we live in a world where externalities are given and where uh, the only way that we progress is by accepting those externalities. Uh, we're now confronting the results of casting things as separate from what we're doing, right? So climate change is because we made the carbon footprint of our economy an externality that we don't have to worry about. Okay, so we're realizing that we, we can't do that anymore. And it's not as, I don't believe that it's as simple as recomplexifying our economy, recomplexifying our politics, because we're seeing that, especially in the political realm, we're already breaking underneath the complexity of the decisions that we're trying to make. So we need to find another way to grapple with that complexity and to find the right way to simplify that work so that we can actually take action and we don't become paralyzed through uh, the overwhelming amount of data and, and other things that we need to analyze. And I think that the opportunity for design specifically in this context is to, the, the, the value of design is that it is a way of making values extant in the world, right? Putting values into a thing because they are always there. And that that thing sits in a room and allows a higher bandwidth discussion than words do. So in the same way that, you know, we might, um, we might like the idea that people can sit in parliament and just debate the truth, <laughs> what we found is that it doesn't work. So we need other ways that we can consider and make choices about how we're going to live together. And I think the part of the reason, or part of the way that we do that is by moving to a mode of making decisions between legitimate concrete alternatives, whether they're visualized or prototyped or I don't know what, experienced in your work, uh, and that increasingly we have to find those higher bandwidth ways to encounter the possibility because making decisions just based on conjecture, or based on verbal descriptions back and forth, has proven to be exhaustive. And I think that's it. Could we please have a big warm round of applause?